In 2011, the Disney movie Sharpay's Fabulous Adventure was a risky attempt at capitalizing on Ashley Tisdale's breakout character from the High School Musical movies. Although this spinoff had put a nail in the coffin for what had unfortunately become a chaotic, infuriating, and messy franchise. Sort of like any McDonald's location in all of Manhattan. Do you want to wait 30 minutes to get your food while someone changes their baby's diaper next to the napkin dispenser? It was Halloween horror nights in there and I used to go every day. But Sharpay's version of the Big Apple doesn't feature any of those less savory details, mostly because it was shot in clean, affordable Toronto, Canada, which is what New York City would look like if it went on Lexapro. Unfortunately, this movie's script also rushes to make the mean girl from the previous movies into a likable main character, fails to find any central conflict that is well-paced or believable, and gives such a disproportionate amount of time to a couple of trained animals that you'll start to wonder if it was just easier for the crew to come up with new types of dog tricks rather than actual human dialogue. It's time for a not so fabulous adventure through a not quite New York City in another installment of Clip Breakdown. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content on the web. And we break it down like a working actress in New York City to look at each individual clip and decide, oh, you get a call back, or no mama, you should stick to your day job working at the copy center. And this movie, ugh, like I, I, it had me at the beginning, I think. I remember liking the first 10 minutes and then it, I'll, sh I'll point out where we really get, where we really get lost. Look at me talking like I don't know the words. Oh, but before we get into it, I should really super duper ask you, please make sure to give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns on Disney movies like this. Also, don't forget to click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive Exclusive content. I guess since this was a spinoff of High School Musical, I guess I assumed there would be like a full musical portion to this, but it's just a couple songs. Uh, but you'll see, I, my, my hopes were set up because of this opening song, which is a song. Sharpay, I don't want to worry you, but I think your dog might have suffered from a seizure recently because he, he didn't walk like that yesterday. And I'm keeping an eye on your motor function as well because you completely missed your lips when you tried to hit that vape pen. Just kidding everyone, she's putting on frosted lipstick with her crayon. <laughs> this musical number, I like Ashley Tisdale's voice. I have Ashley Tisdale songs like It's All Right, It's Okay on my running playlist. I don't think she sounds too good in any of these songs. Wait, why did this song just become about her dad's congenital heart disease? She really just said, He'll survive, and he'll go to physical therapy, but we'll cry, cause he won't be the same man he used to be. Like what? Maybe avoid getting into any specific medical prognosis with your lyrics and just stick to vaguely motivating phrases, like how you wanna shine. Because apparently, Sharpay can't sing about anything remotely meaningful without it getting suddenly very dark. Heart attack, come on. Like an angel in Armani, I'm too fabulous. It's crazy that even though Ashley Tisdale was made executive producer of this movie, she still had difficulties on set getting the respect she deserved from that blonde wig she'll be wearing throughout this fabulous adventure. Ashley got that job and she said, my first executive decision is that I'm never bleaching my fucking hair again. I don't care if it looks like I'm cosplaying as Elsa from Frozen for 90 minutes. It's not worth the cuticle damage. It's not that the wig is like bad looking by any means. I kind of feel like her head is like two inches taller the whole time. And again, I'm not trying to discriminate against people who wear wigs. It's just that she was really obviously like described as being a natural blonde in the first few movies. So it's a little distracting to me. Sorry. The actors who played Sharpay's parents in the first movies, they're back. On a scale of one to 10, you were an entirely different scale. And you know my aversion to scales. That mom's hairstyle is called Hillary Clinton just ran an obstacle course. And yes, yes, we must of course show women who are unhappy with their body weight, especially in 
teen movies. Even though this actress looks like she couldn't weigh much more than the mummified corpse in Norman Bates's basement. I don't know, I think this is like a charity gala or something. I don't know what the nature of this performance is that we just saw. It's not important because it leads to a huge opportunity. I'm a casting agent from New York. I'm about to start casting for a new musical on Broadway. I would be more than happy to arrange an audition if you happen to find yourself in the Big Apple anytime soon. Are you kidding? Of course. But since you're the same actor who played Joey Jeremiah in Degrassi, I'm going to assume that by the Big Apple you are referring to the country store and pie factory in Ontario. Because Sharpay's big adventure was shot in Toronto to look like New York, I want everyone to hunker down and enjoy a hearty helping of New York City stock footage, generic exterior and medium shots that carefully frame out the skyline upon sidewalks that look Disney World clean. Canadian people, why aren't you still throwing your litter and waste into the streets like it's the pre-industrial revolution? Bunch of nerds. I wanna say, I don't think it's impossible to shoot Toronto for New York at all. Like the movie Elf, I think did this particularly well, but it wasn't 100%. Like they spent, I think a week or two getting exterior shots in actual Manhattan Manhattan, like the stuff where Buddy the Elf is running around on the streets. Probably not even the parts in Central Park were actually New York. But it allows you to get some original footage with your characters in front of some New York iconography. And it helps really sell that New York is a character in the film in a way that Sharpay's adventure doesn't really. I mean, I guess for a kid it would because it's all like a cartoon version of Broadway. But I just, I would have loved if they could have brought like Fly Ashley Tisdale to New York for a week. You could afford a Disney. So this casting director, who he himself directed to show as many teeth as possible during his performance, he gives the opportunity for her to come to New York and audition, but Sharpay's dad is really not into it. He doesn't feel like she's ready to go off on her own, even though he apparently gave her this gap year after graduating to figure out what she wanted to do with her life. She filled that time up by joining her country club's talent show. Okay, Sharpay, you're in the real world now. It's not High School Musical anymore, sweetie. But luckily her friends are there to help her enact a plan to convince her father. Texted Bridget, who emailed Constance, who tweeted Bethany, who I am Jen, who Facebook Kara, who knows of a New York apartment available in a luxury townhouse. Wait, did you just say Constance is back on Twitter? Ugh. We need to call her parents. You know she only uses that account to score drugs. Also, I know that she's the star of the movie now, so they needed Sharpay to have more humanity, but the Sharpay Evans that I remember from High School Musical would have been like, listen, sweetie, I don't care if you are Paige Michael Chuck from Degrassi. You need to get those pork and cabbage pot sticker toes off of my bed. I love when a Canadian movie has like more than one Degrassi actor in it because it's like, yay, they deserve, <laughs> like there are a lot of people in Degrassi grassy and so it makes sense that they would all be pulled from the same casting pool. It is equal distance from both Chanel and Wicked. Ah! Well, Wicked was at the Gershwin Theater, so based on the nearest Chanel store to that, it looks like you'll also have a great view of Trump Tower. And I know your country club owning father must idolize that guy. I bet you can catch Mr. Evans in his study every night watching reruns of The Apprentice while he skull an overripe pumpkin that he calls Donald. The plan was basically like, find a place to live, show that I can do it, like set up an audition. So the plan was just doing the planning for the trip that she wasn't allowed to go on, but now she has to like make her final plea to her dad and the mom is like a little more on board. You know, my dear college friend Michelle has a son that goes to NYU. I've met him, he's a very nice boy. I could ask her to make sure that he keeps his eye on you. Oh yes, Sharpay, I think the whole audience would feel much better if you had a male chaperone with the advanced wisdom to keep you safe, even though he's the same age as you and as we'll see, has even skinnier arms. I feel like this idea already doesn't make sense, but then we actually meet this character later and he's always swinging around his camera and taking up the entire sidewalk in a way that would actually make me more likely to attack them on the street. But the dad is convinced, although he has an ultimatum. He tell Sharpay, you got one month to get out there, do this audition and make it work for yourself in New York. Otherwise you have to come back and work for me at the country club. And here's what I think. Like I liked this part as like the stakes feel life or death because to Sharpay, whose dream is to make it onto Broadway, as we heard from the first movie, this would be like the ultimate chance. She has to make it on Broadway or she has to come back home and work at this job. And we already know she's very averse to hard work. She likes
likes to live the fabulous life. So if nothing else for this movie, I'm happy to say that the stakes feel adequately high. That being said, I'm not sure about the characters here. Like I feel like the dad from the previous movies was ready to let Sharpay never work a day in her life. I think it would have been cool if the parents had some reason to motivate Sharpay to stop, you know, basically floundering for a whole year. Like maybe if her excess spending got her into trouble, like she bought herself a new car and then crashed it. Listen to my big budget idea. Something like that where her carelessness gets the family into trouble. So they really want to teach her the value of hard work. Then for me, it would also have those high stakes, but also a motivation for her to actually change a little bit and really establish that she's a flawed character at the beginning. But instead the script chooses some other ways to give her these initial conflicts at the beginning of the first act. Like she arrives at her luxury condo townhouse, which to me has like these really weird looking slate floors, but whatever. And as it turns out, dogs are not allowed. So they do try to sell that Sharpay spoiled where she's like, listen, if the dog goes, I go. So obviously she's back out on the streets with all of her pink luggage. That's when she's approached by a stranger with a video camera who like in my world, in reality, if that happened to me, I would be karate kicking them to death. Like that's scary. Do you always just film totally stunning people on the street that you don't know? Only when I think the subject is interesting and you look baffled and scared. Hmm, interesting that you found the sight of a vulnerable woman to be such an intriguing and exciting opportunity. I'm gonna start screaming now. To be fair, Sharpay is seated in the absolute middle of the sidewalk with a mountain of furniture perched perfectly with her dog sitting on a separate piece of luggage. Someone styled this for an editorial shoot for Vogue and it's, you can't help a camera operator for coming up and trying to snag a free shot. But don't get your hopes up, Sharpay. This guy's not a pro. In fact, he's the scum of the earth. I'm a film student at NYU, working on a short film. The assignment is to capture one unique New York story. As someone who graduated from the film program at NYU, they don't even let you touch a camera till halfway through sophomore year. You literally have to study sound and image as a theory for a whole year before they even want to hear what sort of ideas you come up with to break their equipment. In either case, I really don't trust either of these two characters to give us a unique story of any kind since, you know, Ken and Barbie already exist. If Sharpay told her a unique story, she'd be like, my dad is paying for a penthouse for a month, but not the one I thought. She has plenty of money and never really has to like work for money throughout all of this. So the struggle that they try to show for her throughout New York feels empty because it's not financial at all, which is probably the more relatable, you know, problem to most people trying to make it in a city. By some convenient coincidence of the universe, this is Peyton, the studying kid from NYU who was meant to keep an eye on Sharpay. He was just coming to the building to check on Sharpay. So he's like, what are you doing out here? And she's like, well, I can't go because my dog is not letting me. So he's like, well, there's a studio apartment in my building. And so blah, 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 movie magic. She's able to get all of this luggage over to a new studio. They never once talk about the geography of like what neighborhood anything is in here. It's not important. They do try to sell us that like, you know, when Sharpay arrives at this studio apartment, she's off put by how small and unattractive it is. So not only does this all feel kind of stale and familiar, but also, so it's just like, you know, as soon as she wasn't put in the luxury apartment, we knew this was what was gonna happen. Oh, also on a creepy note, Peyton's apartment is right across the breezeway so he can look at her changing her bra anytime he wants. Well, joke's on you, Peyton, because I don't wear a bra. I just smack two slices of salami there to make sure everything stays humid. Because she's so discouraged, Peyton brings Sharpay somewhere special to keep her feeling motivated. I'm gonna meet with that casting director, get the part, be a star, and have a Alice. There you go. That's the self-indulgent, self-entitled, optimistic pink hurricane I've been seeing through my lens. Sharpay is like, I know that I like trust you now, but I think I'm still gonna pepper spray you anyway, just for saying that. Just because Peyton is a full-time film student, it doesn't mean he needs to talk in student film dialogue full-time. Like this kid is actually fluent in overwriting. Also, he really just called her self-indulgent and self-entitled as though it was a compliment and Sharpay is like, you're perceptive. That's not a nice thing to say. Like, I guess that lines up with who Sharpay's character was in the first three movies, but Sharpay, her 
herself never prided herself on being those things. She was motivated, but she didn't see herself as self-entitled. Did she? I mean, I don't know. Either way, it doesn't fit with this movie that he's like, that's what he sees and instantly is attracted to. They give off like cousin vibes the whole time. However, he also gave her the nickname Pink Hurricane, which I am familiar with. That's what they call it at a sex party when someone's colon gets blown out. Some New York City stock footage. Then we show a montage of Sharpay trying to enjoy New York City by eating a pretzel, watching a break dancer, buying a hot dog. Oh, and they decorate her room so that it matches her pink sensibility. Sensibilities. Oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that was supposed to be the last shot of your movie because you either just painted over the camera lens or directly onto Ashley Tisdale's wide open eyeballs. In either case, one of you is gonna have to make an insurance claim very soon. In her first night, the Murphy bed flips up and I'm like, that literally happened in The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Uh, okay. I'm not here to police the originality of the Disney studio. Maybe it's self-referential, but you know what else? It was just generic comedy, you know what it is. But feeling confident and re-inspired. I don't know how much time passed throughout all of this, but I guess that was one day, geez. Sharpay shows up to the casting director and is shocked by this stunning reveal. Wait, what? It's your dog that we want to audition. I mean, didn't the title of the musical give you any indication? I guess I just thought the writer was being literary when you said it was a musical called Dog Sex and Kennel Cough. But if that's actually what the show is about, then yeah, I can see how I'd uh, have a, a hard time fitting into the cast. I love that this casting director is like, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't realize I was talking about the trained dog that clearly upstaged you at your own performance? Because to me, it was so obvious that I didn't even bother to explicitly mention it. Like, that dog walked backwards, which is amazing and you tried to rap oh by the way this just became a movie about dogs like Air Bud or Homeward Bound but less focused okay so Joey from Degrassi tells Sharpay sorry but you know if you still want your dog to audition we'd love to have him the dog's name is boy by the way spelled b-o-i and she wants to just immediately go home but she's convinced by Peyton to a stick around and be happy that the dog has this opportunity. I would be like, listen, I'm happy that the dog won't, yeah, but I'm not a professional dog trainer. I'm not gonna show up to eight shows a week to, so that I can stand off stage and be like, come here, little dog. And then making sure the dog has enough water and food. Like she, uh, she's trying to be an actor, not a dog trainer. And also I just hate that Peyton basically has to give her every idea and motivation. And you know, he's constantly there pushing her forward. Like where is that determination that he says that she has. That's the other thing. When he meets her, he's basically like, you're so optimistic and determined. Like you just said, I'm coming to New York and I'm gonna be on Broadway. It's like, no, she thought someone told her to come to New York and be uh, like audition to be on Broadway. It's not like she was just like, I'm gonna make it happen. And even that little checklist plan she put together to get to New York was just like organizing simple things. It's not like she showed, oh, I'm willing to uh, work at a car wash and, and delouse my dog myself in order to show that I'm, you know, like, I feel like the movie should be about her learning that there is value in working for herself, but they try to make it about just like remaining positive generally. Anyway, Ashley does go in, Charpay does go in to audition her dog, which is a very complex audition for this to be for a dog. <laughs> I literally just felt my brain like switch to delta waves as I mentally checked out of this movie. Yeah, I know about brain waves because I was in a sleep study to try to figure out why I kept waking up with strangers in my bed. Turns out the reason was alcoholism. This song is like, we're the perfect bear. Me and my boy. It's awful. The music, like, I don't like one single song in this. And again, Ashley Tisdale has this great pop voice, but when they try to strip it down, so it's just her and a piano, it sounds like auto-tuned, like singing through a metal tube. The American Humane Society was like, so no animals were harmed during the making of this film, but one of the dogs definitely struggled to get traction since Ashley Tisdale's spray tan was a little bit more oily than in rehearsals. Also, why does this dog audition have so much human singing? We just needed to see if the dog could do the tricks. We didn't even need your leg for that. He could have just balanced on a chicken bone and there'd be no difference. Have I mentioned that I'm obsessed with Ashley Tisdale? I'm not making fun of her legs. I'm just making fun of how they always put her in these shorts that like, 
like are too wide for her legs. So she looks like she has toothpicks for legs. Okay, so there's one other kid auditioning their dog to be in this movie. That character's name is Roger Elliston and he's played by Bradley Stephen Perry, who you might remember as the little brother from Good Luck Charlie. And it seems like he's a good vocalist too. I mean, they auto-tune the hell out of the music during this period of, you know, Disneyland. But, oh, also the dogs. He has a dog too, so the dogs interact. Welcome to the subplot about the dog actors falling in love with one another. My only issue is the main plot about Sharpay trying to get a role on Broadway also just became about trying to get the dog a role on Broadway. So right now I'm just trying to find any part of this movie that isn't one of those tiny little dogs with crusty open sore eyeballs. I'm just kidding. I love all dogs, but some of those eyes are out of control. I get Instagram ads for it because apparently I hate it that much that Instagram's like, then you fix it. <laughs> But they sell supplements <laughs> for their crusty eye dog. <laughs> <laughs> Fix it. Again, I love dogs. I don't like movies about dogs, like, cause A, I'm not a child, but B, it's like, the, all I can think about is how much work it must have been to get these dogs to do the right thing, how many takes it must have been to get the perfect shot. Like, it's hours of making dogs do stuff on set. And yeah, there's probably two dogs that played boy in this movie and the other dog as well, but I just don't like it. I don't like it. it a, because animals shouldn't have to work. I mean, I'm sure they don't know it's work, but it is. And B, like, just make a movie about Sharpay trying to get on Broadway, not about her trying to make her dog famous. But that really is what she thinks. She's like, all right, I gotta get boy this part on Broadway because then I'll become friends with Amber Lee, who is the big star, as we found out, of this play. And she thinks that's gonna somehow be her, you know, ladder to fame. As, since she only has a month in New York, it would be cool if they also were like showing her how other working actors have to try to make it work in New York. Like, there's plenty of gags there. Running to audition, being at a cattle call, getting cut off when you're singing or they play your song wrong, whatever. We get really stuck in this dog training backstage world and it quickly, 10 minutes ago, becomes super annoying. Here's Bradley singing. Watch us do our stuff. Oh boy, he's breaking it down with the enthusiasm of a white TikToker who gets to dance to a song with the N-word in it. This movie also flips the high school musical tradition of making us sit through an entire song and then having Sharpay immediately repeat it in a pop tempo. Because now that's what happens with this, what's his name? God, Roger does. He like does the same song, but it's a little flashier. To me, this gag was a hilarious treat with Bop to the Top in the first high school musical musical movie, but at this point in the franchise, it sort of feels like a plastic wrapped turd that they just took out of the freezer from five years ago at Disney headquarters. Roger's performance here doesn't even sound much different from Sharpay's because they use the same vocal filters. So it feels like as the audience, we're just supposed to be impressed by this dog's different set of tricks that happened during the song. I don't know about you, but I can't even imagine some type of dog trick that would like blow my mind and impress me me in a movie unless they were using actual like magic. It all feels the same. So it's like watching the Purina National Dog Show on American Thanksgiving, but it's not a large meal that's making me sleepy. It's these foolish dancing dogs and the shallow music. The director and writer of the show are equally as impressed by both of the dogs and they can't decide who's going to be in the show. So already we've set up this rivalry between Roger and Sharpay and that's when Amber Lee comes in. She's the big Starlet, who's going to be the main headliner of the show. I'm a mega fan. Oh, you are not. <laughs> so am. I am going to tweet about you right now. Shut up. I follow your tweets. Mm. She did. She tweeted. In case you were too young to remember, in the early 2010s, the more often your movie mentioned tweeting or Facebooking, the more super teen fun time surfs up party points it would receive from the audience. Also, I feel like this was back in the early age of Twitter where Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, and Justin Bieber would just blast out every single thought they had while they were sitting on the toilet. The band 303 was really popular. It was a different time. LMFAO, what? Oh, oh, and also I used to be so excited because Nicki Minaj retweeted me on Twitter, but Nicki Minaj on Twitter 
have been trying it with me lately because of misinformation around vaccines. The fact of the matter is Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine has been FDA approved for use of people ages 16 and older. And kids age 12 to 16 are still able to get the vaccine under its emergency authorization use. There are no known cases of infertility being caused by any of the COVID-19 vaccines. And on top of that, the vaccine is working. 99% of the deaths right now being caused by COVID-19 are in unvaccinated people, according to the CDC. Still, apparently three out of 10 eligible Americans are not vaccinated still. According to KFF, which is a trusted source in the healthcare community, and it's completely nonpartisan, I'm sure a lot of the people watching this are already vaccinated, but I mean, let's talk about vaccination more as people. I think that's the next step towards kind of defeating remaining hesitancy is like, let's have conversations with our friends and our family about vaccination, about the use of cultural vaccine passport. The more we keep that in the conversation within our personal bubbles, the more likely we are to help reach the people who need to hear it and let us beat this at pandemic. Anyway, I love this actress who plays Amber Lee. Her name is Cameron Goodman. I am just so excited to be performing on the Great White Way. Not that I don't love all colors. <laughs> That's a pretty self-aware joke for a movie whose only black character that gets a speaking role is Sharpay's friend from the beginning who booked a flight for her. Albuquerque to New York. One adult and one dog. Coach? <laughs> the only coach that I f with is the one who teaches youth soccer at the playground down the street. Although I think he's getting fired since one of the goalies went missing while we were in the bushes. Hey, I assumed he had like an assistant coach or a parent watching or something. That's on him. When men have to choose between sports and all of this voluptuous body, you know which way they go. It's choose your own adventure and they wanna follow the path to Nick. Okay, Amber is like, I can't choose which dog. They're both so great. And I think the best way to do it is to let them both rehearse with us and see which one I get along with better. And to me, I'm just like, you would need both dogs to do a Broadway show, if not more. I'm pretty sure, like they've had dogs on Broadway before. It's always multiple dogs. I could almost swear. I mean, it would be crazy to make a dog do eight shows a week. And what if the dog got sick or tired? Dogs look similar enough that it doesn't matter. Just train two dogs. And even these two dogs, like it clearly doesn't matter which one according to looks. It's not like Toto where you have to have it look like Toto. Also, did I tell you the actual title for this show is Girl's Best Friend. So it's like a, a Broadway musical about a girl and, and her dog. I'm not gonna buy tickets to that. It also bothers me that this movie, when it gets to the Broadway level, completely ignores the existence of understudies. Since Sharpay proved she's aware of the concept back in the first movie when she told, uh, what's her hell? What's her Helen? What's her Helen name? Helen? When she told Tracy Turnblad, nope, Gabrielle or Garber, Gabriella Garbo. Gabriella. She told Gabriella uh, that she could be her understudy in the show, but apparently Broadway shows don't have those and neither do dogs. Amber Lee really likes you too. Is she awesome or what? Yeah, she's super suspiciously nice in such a way that can only mean she's about to become the twist antagonist of this movie. Also, I feel like you have two weeks left to show your dad that you're a working actress, so maybe you could audition for one or two things. Her current plan of reaching Broadway stardom by being best friends with Amber Lee on its own would take way longer than two weeks anyway. She would need longer than that for Amber Lee to be like, you know what, let's get you a role on the show. Ugh, I punched this movie in the face. Roger comes up and he's like, may the best dog win. It's on. My dog has all of this training, but the two dogs look back at each other longingly because this is a movie where the dogs are in love. Like the dog back at the apartment is even looking out at the sky thinking about the other dog. And I'm just like, dogs don't act like this. Am I supposed to feel like dogs act like this? I thought this movie was based in reality somewhat, but I guess dogs are like cartoon dogs now. Sharpay and Peyton are working on his student film and he's kind of explaining his goals. If my professor loves my film, he talks about it. Then there's a buzz. Then it gets in a festival. Then it gets distribution. Then I'm signing a studio deal. Then I'm getting an Oscar. All right, well, don't get too ahead of yourself since it seems like you still haven't even learned that it's important to shut the f 
fuck up when you're recording someone. I don't know how you're gonna edit this documentary about Sharpay together when you can't even edit the number of leather bracelets you're wearing at a single time. Not that I'm the fashion police, but if you walk through Hell's Kitchen with that much gear on, you will be ushered into a fetish bar. So be ready, Peyton. You better be ready for some daddy d- <laughs> <laughs> but we can tell that Sharpay is, you know, totally inspired by his tenacity. And then we go into first rehearsals for this Broadway show. Like with other movies about the theater, I feel like they capture the backstage vibe quite well. You are all amazing. Uh, no, you are. Camber me. You. <laughs> no, you. Me? Okay. <laughs> this reads as very authentic. The borderline manic energy that theater people get from the first day of rehearsal on a new show is identical to the feeling of getting high on crystal meth. And in either situation, all of the gay men in the room will eventually end up having sex. So there's something to the science. Amber Lee gives us some funny moments that are not funny enough to show you where she's like, I don't get this joke. Like it's just showing that she doesn't really understand the script. And Roger, that little kid, he decides that he's gonna play dirty when it comes to giving his dog the advantage. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, very clever young man. He's going to poison Sharpay's dog with salmonella. Although these shoes are technically vegan leather due to cost, we still like to piss off PETA by rubbing dead animal parts on them anyway. It's free press whenever they tweet about us. See, I mentioned Twitter. I'm a cool mom. Obviously, the chicken shoes mess up uh, Sharpay's dog's performance, and she realizes instantly that there's sabotage afoot, so she's like, it's on. While watching it, I definitely understood that there's showing us, oh, she's getting sidetracked by going back to her old, maybe devious character flaws where she's willing to go tit for tat and play ruthlessly to get the part. But for me, I don't think it's enough of a distraction for her to get all distracted by trying to make like her dog the star of a show. I wish that the distraction, like, cause what is the, what is it distracting her from? Being friends with Amber Lee? Or is she supposed to really care about the dog getting in the show now for the dog's sake? Like so that the dog, she can be happy for the dog. Does she want to be an actress or not? Either way, this is not going to make her an actress in time to go live in New York after a month. And like her dad wouldn't even be able to tell her to come home and work at a country club if she just got a job in New York and was paying her own way, which doesn't seem to ever occur to her. But while Sharpay is distracted with this trivial rivalry, trivial rivalry, Amber Lee's got her own motives. This is my show. I'm America's sweetheart. They're paying to see me, not you two overbred furballs. Excuse me, I think you mean inbred furballs. And in the dog world, that's seen as a cool and exclusive thing, just like in the British royal family. So now we know Amber Lee wants this to be her show and her goal is to get the dogs basically written out. The show is literally about a dog, so this doesn't make any sense. Also like, <sighs> Even an actress who's the lead human in a show about a dog would get all of the press. Who's gonna be at the interviews? The dog? Like, yeah, maybe, but they're, you're the only human. You're gonna get all of the human attention. Anyway, what do I know? Sharpay has to like quickly do this little scheme to fool her dad on video chat that she's living in a penthouse, which just means sitting in front of an open window. Or do they run up to the roof maybe? No, they just go over to a window, so whatever. And he's like, remember, you have two weeks. So they do try to pepper in these little peaks and valleys of suspense, but I just wonder like if the dad was paying for the penthouse, doesn't he wonder why he's not now? He's paying less than that. I wish they just could have made this movie about her learning to work hard. This would have been their opportunity. Watch. What do you mean you forgot my bottled water? I got hit by a bike messenger, so I went to the hospital for like just one second to get these stitches. And meanwhile, I had no water! How could the tweed blazer girl be so mean to the silk scarf as a belt woman? That assistant with her one line had some of the best comedic timing in this whole movie. I love it. I will say, I think this movie had good directing. It was the script for me that missed it. Like there were Like if there's ever a movie that I'm gonna say, it's bad to me in these ways, but you should still watch it because it's funny. This is that like, cause there are moments where I laughed and chuckled because the comedic timing was good. The jokes were delivered well. Like the humor is all executed nicely at certain moments. And I really attribute that to really good direction. Like there's actually funnier moments here than Kenny Ortega was able to give us in the first three High School Musical movies. Like that was funny. She was like, I got hit by a bike. Love it. So Sharpay overhears basically 
basically that assistant getting fired. And when she comes in, Amber Lee is like, would you mind doing a few errands for me? Cause we're like such best friends. I think we're just gonna be best friends. So if you would do these errands for me, I would never let it affect how I feel about boy, but it might. So she's clearly signaling to Sharpay that if she does these friendly favors and acts like a best friend to her, then the dog will get into the show, which is great. That's exactly what Sharpay wants. Amber Lee says the wire is hurting her scalp. Personally, I think she's using the wrong shampoo. She's a star and you know, I don't want to say anything. You're hot. Excuse me? You're hot. See, is it so much to ask for that to be the reaction I get from every person that I meet? Why not? I look like Ashley Tisdale. If you compare our internal organs, our livers are probably similar shapes, so why won't the sound guy f me? It's a little rude, don't you think? No, your mic's hot. It, it means it's on. It's it's going through the entire theater. Amberly's got a great scalp. That would have ended up much more embarrassing for me because after the first time I heard him say that I was hot, I would have been like, you're hot too, Mr. Audio with the body -o, so why don't you grab that bottle of mineral oil that they use to lube up the dolly tracks and meet me in the nearest electrical closet in five minutes. Oh great, that just played through the whole auditorium. Guess it's an open invitation now. <laughs> I'm practicing my Halloween laughter for October. Obviously, I should mention right now, you need to let me know what Halloween movies to cover. I'm thinking about October. Just let that marinate. Outside of rehearsal, Sharpay is telling Peyton that this for in with Amber Lee is the advantage she's been waiting for. But Peyton is already like, well, why do you need to cheat to get your dog in the show? And like, you don't need an advantage to make it on your own. None of that makes sense to me because if that were true, then the whole plan of getting the dog into the show would be for no reason. Like, yes, she does need the advantage. And I would argue that, yeah, getting your dog into a Broadway show, like you could find your way to be a Broadway actor from there. Cause once you audition, your familiar face, like it's real networking. And Peyton doesn't even seem to have a problem with that part. It's just the part where she starts like doing favors for Amber. Like for example, Amber wakes her up in the middle of the night and calls her over just to like, for something pointless, like to reach something on a shelf. Only a true friend would come all the way down here at this hour and help me with something like that. So I passed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ashley Tisdale's wig stylist said, listen, once that thing goes on her head, it's no longer my department. In fact, some say at that point, it gets a mind of its own. And I swear I saw Ashley feed it a bite of her salad at lunch the other day. I don't know why they couldn't smooth down her flyaways for this shot, but I find the hair distracting enough that I probably would have just dyed it blonde again if I were her. Like I get that she was the executive producer and could really do what she wanted, but this is you in a starring role as your most iconic character. But of course, she had every right to say no. I want to look like an unlicensed sleeping beauty type character who was hired for a birthday party. That's her choice. So as her new best friend, it's pretty obvious that, uh, I keep wanting to call her Ashley. It's not f***ing Ashley. It's clear that Amber Lee wants to treat her best friend, Sharpay, as a free assistant, making her get ready for rehearsal, highlighting lines all night, being at her beck and call. But Sharpay is clearly so focused on the goal that she doesn't see that she's being used. I have to highlight script changes for Amber Lee, then highlight her hair. I miss spending time with you. And you did promise to shoot some more stuff for my film. You know what I'm doing is important too. Oh, a minute there, you sounded like Amber Lee. Why, because she's focusing on her career like she came there to do and not hanging out on a musty twin mattress with you? The script really wants us to feel like a Sharpay is losing her sense of self by becoming Amber Lee's unpaid assistant. But it's only because they show Peyton here saying that he liked her better back when she refused to work for anybody else and just kind of expected her acting career to be handed to her after a lifetime of privilege. Like how is that more likable? I really feel like this movie should have made it about Sharpay learning how to work hard to get to where she's going as a performer. Instead, they're just like, oh no, she's a perfect, magically talented, perfect performer. Everyone loves her singing and dancing. It's already Broadway caliber, but this is not her show. We need the dog. So the movie is literally about her training the dog to get the part. I wish that while she was struggling to get her dog on the show or trying to be at Amber Lee's beck and call, it also showed her like trying to take the subway to dance classes, show her at singing lessons, improving her craft, hitting the pavement, going to auditions, all while trying to walk the dogs and get the part for the dog because she thinks that'll be helpful. And then maybe she gets some sort of opportunity, maybe even through Peyton's school where his film school friends are like, hey, you should come audition to be in our big movie that's gonna be in a festival. 
but she doesn't go because she has to do this stuff for the dog. And then it's like, you're choosing to be the assistant over what you originally came here to do. That's my rewrite. Like that's just one option for how it could be better, but it's like already so much better. I can just tell you from my own brain watching it. But we're supposed to accept this as like, ooh, she's losing herself. According to Pateman, Pateman's judgmental pavement. So in the next scene, Amber Lee suddenly has a full list of errands for her best friend Sharpay. And when you see Sharpay be like, you're giving me errands? It reminds Amber Lee to be like, oh right, yeah, um, I think I'm giving you the part, so why don't you just do them? Again, I just start to feel like she's not the same Sharpay as we met in the other movies. Her intonation is different, her decisions as a character feel different, but whatever. Are you serious? Almost positive. You won't be sorry. <laughs> Trust me, I know. She said, sweetheart, I didn't even feel sorry when I that film student whose crotch you've been snipping. And yes, he did continue holding his huge camera and messenger bag during sex. It was very unwieldy. He said, it's part of my art. It goes into a montage, if you can call it that, of Sharpay having to do Amber Lee's chores, which include scrubbing a toilet, which she holds the brush backwards because she doesn't know how to do it, filling up a washing machine and putting, I guess, the wrong kind of soap in it. Although all it shows is her not being able to open it again later. Like I could have sworn and the gag would have been for like foam to start overflowing out of it, but I guess we didn't have the budget for that gag. These are the moments where I'm like, who, this was such a cash grab for Disney. Anyway, this sort of montage of Sharpay working could have been used to much greater effect if it showed her working on things that actually matter to the plot, like her becoming a better performer or learning what it takes to be a working actor and not just having it handed her like she originally thought when she came. But we can't get into all that because uh, Roger, the nemesis, gets some of the script changes for the new blocking for the dog and decides not to give it to Sharpay so that her dog will be confused and do the wrong thing on set. So that happens and it obviously embarrasses Sharpay and they're like, it's on. But right as they're about to start fighting, they realize that their two dogs, boy and whatever, have run off together. What could they be doing? They're like, they're probably at each other's throat. But this is what really happened. I know you love me. I know you care. This Justin Bieber song is playing here. The way these music groups will try to steal profit from my video for playing three beats from one of their songs is even more criminal than the waste of time that this movie creates with a full on dog romance montage. Like why is this movie now about two dogs sitting on trash? They had to get those dogs to sit still so we could get a full 360 rotation of them on a pile of trash? That was how we show them having fun? Or riding in a buggy that they somehow paid for? Disney has already released several movies about dogs falling in love. So if that's what this one is also secretly about, then I would like to put in a request that the horse pulling that carriage lady in the tramples me to death. Cause I don't want to watch a dog movie. I didn't sign up for a dog movie. I thought Sharpay was going to be on Broadway. Like it shows him running in slow motion through a sprinkler. Like shut the f up with these dogs. And all of this time, we're supposed to know that Sharpay and Roger are like looking around. We couldn't have had those shots of the dogs doing three things interspersed with them, like hanging up posters or going around and showing pictures to people in the city. Instead, it just goes to a scene where Roger and Sharpay are like, what's gonna happen? And then Peyton comes up and he's like, I have both the dogs. They came right home. It's like, you didn't want to show us that? They didn't want the dogs to come running up to Sharpay and Roger, like when they're in the park and they play, oh, Sharpay. Pays like my dog loves the sound of um, the pussycat dolls or like my dog always runs when he smells the Gucci or whatever, something sharp hey. They're not finding enough opportunities to make this movie matter to me. Regardless, the like kind of experience of almost losing these two dogs bonds Roger and Sharpay a little bit. So their villainry rivalries has softened. But back at home, things are not so smooth between Peyton and what's her fucking name. Are you so lost in what you're doing that you haven't noticed? Notice what? Boy and Countess are in love. She's supposed to notice that the dog is in love? She ripped that dog away from its own mother at six weeks old and what, now she can never leave New York because it had a fun day playing in the park? What is it even supposed to mean for the plot of this movie for Sharpay that the dog is in love with his competition? You're gonna let the dog enter a serious relationship with the dog of a 12 year old boy? Do you both have to take them on joint dates? Will they eventually get married? What if they have puppies and then get divorced? How will you decide custody? I promise you, 
the follow-up questions would not quickly sound so absurd if the same weren't true about this new romance revelation between the dogs. This is sort of like getting at what they call the denouement in a story arc, which is in the final act where all of the pieces start to come together. And apparently Sharpay is supposed to realize she's been so focused on getting the dog the part that she didn't realize the dog has fallen in love. And it's all coming together that she, her priorities have been skewed, I guess. So she's like, oh my God, how could I have not noticed he's in love? There's a lot you haven't noticed. Like lately, you've had no time for me. You know, I was counting on you to help me finish my film. I said I would and I will. As soon as you learn how to format a fucking call sheet. Who is the professor of this documentary filmmaking class? Heather from the Blair Witch Project? Besides, isn't this film supposed to be about Sharpay's unique New York story? Cause he could be following her around with a camera exposing the hardships of what it's like to be used by this celebrity. He could be following her to the rehearsals when the dog has to practice. Like what else does he want her to do for this film? Come over and perform a floor routine for him? You sold your soul to get boy in that show rather than trust in the dog that you raised. Even worse, you've stopped trusting that your own talents would get you where you need to go. That's so confusing. Are you mad that she ran errands to get her dog the part? Or that she ever tried to get famous via her dog in the first place? Because that was like just a chance opportunity that anyone would take if they had a month to make it in Broadway. And it's not like this guy has any better ideas either. What, you want her to just magically produce her own Broadway show that she can star in? Or are you just mad because she's not your full-time video girl whenever she decides to follow her own plan? Because it seems like none of her ideas are good enough for you. I don't like how this movie sends weird messages to young women about like trust your instinct She's closer to being on Broadway than she ever has been so for him to doubt her he I, it doesn't make sense to me And maybe you're jealous because I'm on my way up with a new famous friend And you're just a student making a film about someone else's life instead of your own his wig just flew off into the East River. And then Ashley Tisdale took off her ponytail wig and put it on him. And then he started yodeling like Heidi because Sharpay just ended him and his entire film career with one sentence. In reality, I don't really understand this insult because he is a film student. And it's not like every good filmmaker is making a film about their own lives, especially if it's a documentary. And that's why I'm glad Sharpay served him this sharp remark because the words were not that deep and and how else should she react to a friend of three weeks who is a man doubting every choice she makes by taking advantage of the fact that her dog is very well trained as a path to get to Broadway? I wish there were some evidence outside of Peyton that she was changing or neglecting her creative spirit in order to appease Amber. And Amber's plan was also because she was jealous of the really talented Sharpay and wanted to keep her subdued. Like maybe Sharpay joined a community theater show or joined like a jam band with some other cool creative girls and she was missing rehearsals or missed the big show because of it. Or she just sells out and she's like, sorry guys, I'm with Amber today at the party party. Then it shows like, oh, she's the Sharpay we thought she was changing out of. But no, we only see it through the eyes of Peyton McWhite boy here. What happened? to that hot pink whirlwind of confidence and ambition I saw through my lens that first day you got here. Baby, you gotta stop reusing all these neon pink cyclone in your lens variations. Because I can't be the only one who feels like that language conjures the imagery of anal prolapse for some reason, as I said. And if I am the only one who feels that way, then I can't believe I just exposed myself like that on my own channel. After telling off the love interest, Sharpay really is getting the full force of Amber's using. And then you can finish these. You're the best. I feel like during this take, everyone on set was like, oh my god, she touched the wig. Ashley told her not to touch the wig. Meanwhile, the wig said, you're the best. <laughs> Now we have our third act conflict, which is Ashley Tisdale's character, Sharpay, hearing what Amber Lee is saying about her. Those mangy mutts are bothering me almost as much as their disposable owners. I actually had to have one of them clean my toilet just to keep her away. But I thought she was having me clean her toilets because she loved me. It makes no sense for Sharpay, who was the master manipulator of High School Musical 2, 1, and 3, my official ranking, to have gone around doing Amber's bidding like this, completely unaware that she was being used for the means to an end. That's exactly the kind of thing she would have done to Gabriella in a, in a previous movie. So it's like,
like, I have a hard time when she's like crying about this realization. I think it would have made more sense if Amber Lee had blinded Sharpay with her love of fabulous things a little more, like invited her to this premiere, introduced her to that cute celebrity who caused friction between her and Peyton. All of those would be options. But instead, she just goes running right to Peyton, who sucks. Everything you said, you were. Right? Yes. Thank you. Ew, did you just say thank you because she said you were right about her being in an emotionally abusive friendship? Like, I think the main thing, I would be like, I'm so sorry, but he's like, thank you. Like, I guess she's apologizing for not believing him there instead of him showing actual care and being like, it's okay. It's very, I told you so. This is where Sharpay has her big realization of how bad she's lost her way, which is unconvincing. Sacrifice integrity for opportunity. I let someone insecure distract me. I cleaned a bathroom. See, when you list it out like that, it becomes really obvious that nothing happened in this movie. I don't feel bad for you because you had to clean one bathroom one time over the course of a month. In fact, in a better movie, that would have developed your character a little bit. Anyway, have we seen the dogs walk on two feet yet or whatever we gotta do to get through this? They could have either lost the dog part thing or just completely downplayed it to an actual subplot rather than the main plot. Also, they could have acknowledged the existence of understudies, you know, like make it so that she worked her way up to be the understudy and then you know whatever so many different ways they could have done this when Roger finds out that Amber Lee doesn't want either of the dogs to be in the show they have to formulate a plan to kind of sabotage Amber Lee's plan to get them both out of the show so they conspire by getting the dogs to attack her oh they're doing like a dress rehearsal where Amber Lee has like invited her entire fan club because she wants her adoring fans to be there on her first performance this is exactly why I didn't want to do a show with the Dogs and all these boring freaks with no life. They came to see. <gasps> <gasps> Hear that, Amberly? That's the sound of your career flopping so hard that nobody even comes to your funeral. Too bad you aren't a man who said something even more reprehensible on a hot mic, or the Republican Party could have endorsed you as their presidential candidate. Quick, Amber, say something else that helps us spin this into locker room talk. I'll Google some examples. Okay, the first thing that comes up is verbal locker room threesome. Ooh, I think these search results are a little more personalized than I originally thought. So this is why they introduced the idea of the hot mic in the first or second act, because they needed it to be the Chekhov's gun that took down Amber later, because all of her fans boo her off stage. On her way out, she's like, well, I quit the show. And that means there is no show, and we can all blame Sharpay. Now nobody works, so the whole cast supposedly hates her. Even though, again, there would be an understudy to just take Amber's part. And in a different movie, this could have been maybe the opportunity where she's like, well, I'm the understudy, but whatever. The point is, it's Sharpay's last day of the month that she had to make it onto Broadway, so she feels like she lost her plan, and she's getting ready to go home. Peyton is trying to talk her out of it, though. He's like, we still have eight hours left. It's like, what the f can you do? She has to sleep. This isn't how my movie's supposed to end. Oh my god, this guy really loves to make it about himself all the time, doesn't he? It seems like your movie is about Sharpay, but only when she's living her life the way you want her to. I feel like this guy is three scenes away from being like, oh, in my movie, you let me put my hand up your shirt. Sharpay gets a call that she has to come and pick up boys' stuff from the dressing room. So when she's there, they catch the tail end of the director being like, I'm so sorry, the show's over. Thank you all for your hard work. But Peyton is like, I'm coming through with the video evidence, mama. Look, there's someone who knows the part by heart and who is amazing. Oh, Shelby, what is going on? I feel invisible here. Nothing is working out the way I planned it. I know I'm not the director, but I already have a lot of notes on that performance. Her delivery is giving me high school production of Wizard of Oz, where there was clearly a better option for Dorothy, but they had to give part to a senior. It was just politics that you didn't get Dorothy Stephanie. I don't blame you for dropping out of the ensemble. Then it goes into Ashley delivering a very long song. Ugh. Again, I don't know why he was even recording this or why this was part of the rehearsal, but she's like, if you give me a chance, I'll take it. Again. It's a little too Broadway to showcase Ashley Tisdale's vocal styles, I think. Like, they really wanted this to feel like a musical at certain points with a ballad, and I'm just like, mm, falls flat. But the director and the writer absolutely love the video, and they're like, we did it! Sharpay, will you be our lead? And she has doubt, even though this is literally what she's wanted since the time we met her seven movies ago. I'm scared.
Peyton has some of the most unsettling reactions to Sharpay at times when most other people would offer her a hug. He loved it when she looked scared on the street, said thank you when she admitted to being used, and then reassures her when she's scared by saying, finally. Like there was never a point in the movie where they established like it was a problem that she was never afraid of anything. In fact, he said that's what he loved about her. So I'm lost. Flash forward 7,000 hours maybe, and it's opening night of the Broadway show. Let's get it over with. I feel like stage performers love when they get to pretend to be in slow motion. Those dancers are like, whoa, f yeah. I didn't go to theater school for four years to do things at normal speed. Wait, was this final scene about her giving the dog up for adoption? Because that was not the twist I expected. And this is a musical about the dog and the dog is gone. So whoops, maybe they did kill off the dog <laughs> in rewrites after they workshopped it. Check out the show tune hands on this. I am obsessed. <laughs> Oh no wait, there's the dog. And he's like, wait, 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 you all got Chipotle for lunch while I got Alpo? But that's all she wrote for Sharpay's My Beautiful Little Adventure. What did you guys think? The High School Musical series is over with this, except for the actual series, which I guess also exists. Anyway, give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more from this era of Disney, the 2011s. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So don't forget to turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when it's the rest of my life that starts Starting right now. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon where you can access exclusive content like virtual watch parties and oh, extra bonus episodes. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for training a dog with me today. I will see you next time. <laughs>